Welcome to the Coalition for Networked Information podcast. I'm Jerry Bain for Educause Review, and this interview features a conversation with Judith Conklin, Chief Information Officer for the Library of Congress. You can find more conversations from the CNI meetings by visiting the Educause Review website at er.educause.edu. Here's our conversation. What are some of the digital strategies that are embedded in the new Library of Congress strategic plan? So I would like to first start about the previous strategic plan for the Library of Congress. It was 2016 and it was a five-year plan, and we collaborated with all the business leaders, um, but we also, at that time, determined we should have a digital strategic plan. And so it was separate from the Library of Congress strategic plan, and we went for five years with that. Within the Library of Congress strategic plan, everything we did had to be pointed to our goals of the Library of Congress strategic plan. Mm -hmm. What we found out in that five years was the business leaders and the staff were not pointing uh, to the digital strategic plan with their goals and their directional plans, what we call them, their, their business directional plans. They, they didn't necessarily look at that document. So when we, about a year before the new strategic plan, the, our strategic planning office uh, brought the business leaders together in numerous sessions, and it was clear to us through that collaboration that digital needed to be baked in to the strategic plan, the new strategic plan. And we, the Librarian of Congress, the Deputy Librarian of Congress and myself, made a decision to forego a separate digital strategic plan, but instead bake it in the strategic plan. Now, what, what was the reason you felt that it needed to be baked in rather than a separate plan pointing to the larger strategic plan? Did you feel like the separateness added some um, complexity that didn't need to be there? Well, one, they didn't always look to the digital strategic plan. It was a separate document, and Mm -hmm. sometimes people would forget it even existed. With it baked in, I like to say the digital is baked in the strategic plan, the new strategic plan, But more importantly, technology and digital is baked in the business now. If technology is not baked in the business, then a CIO is not doing it right. It needs to be baked in the business. We are no longer service providers only. We need to be baked in to the strategic plans, into everything that we do, because Digital and technology is part of the world, and it will never go away. Therefore, it needs to be in that thought process. So now that it's in the strategic plan, not only in that collaboration of developing the strategic plan and all the business leaders at the table and their people at the table, they thought very, very carefully about what do we need from a digital perspective, as well as other things that w- should be in the, the new strategic plan. So if you read our strategic plan, and it is um, on our public website, you can see the digital is absolutely throughout that strategic plan. The title for the strategic plan is A Library for All. Uh, when Dr. Hayden the Librarian of Congress, um, became the the new Librarian of Congress in September 2016. She really wanted to open the treasure chest of the Library of Congress. And that had two aspects the way I look at it. The first is uh, physical 
look at our reading rooms, 22 reading rooms, but also our exhibits, the Great Hall of the Jefferson Building, and that fantastic experience. But also she wanted the American public to see and experience our collections from a distance, that they, as much as possible, they could see our collections and experience our collections without having to come to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. And so now we, we are doing more and more and more in a digital way to open up that treasure chest that the American public can experience us. And that's what her goal has always been since day one. And so I'm very excited about that. And so in the new strategic plan, you will see that, what her thought was and what her directive to us was. So it's a fun time. It's wonderful to be um, at the Library of Congress. It's wonderful to be the chief information officer at the Library of Congress. It's exciting. What do you find most, uh, what are you enjoying the most? Is there a specific aspect you can point to that you're like, ah, this is a lot of fun, this part? What I enjoy the most is the um, being part of the business. Mm -hmm. I'm not a service provider in their minds now. I am a business partner. I'm a strategic partner. And we collaborate very much on what their needs are. And it's seeing the, the users. We have a term at the Library of Congress. It took us about a year to come up with it called users. And what what does that mean? What does that word mean? It's the researchers, people who want to register a copyright. It's Congress, uh, because we serve Congress. Our mission is to serve Congress and the American people. And to see that treasure chest open and to be part of that, um, it's it's absolutely exciting to see all aspects of what we're doing for the institution and for Congress and for the American people and just say, we, I had a part in that. People who work for me have a big part in that. And they're a fantastic group of people and they love the mission. I love the mission. So That's great. Yeah. And one of the things that is um, a huge issue in academia that we talk about a lot is what we call a seat at the table is CIOs not being the plumber, but being yes. the actual uh, architect in some ways yes. to what we're doing. And that's sort of a newer trend it in is the past very much. Five, five to ten years yes. uh, of, of CIOs having a seat at the table. So, so let me talk about sure, that. please do. Back in 2000, uh, there was no CIO. So the then Librarian of Congress, Dr. Billington, uh, had a study done, and in that study from National Science Foundation, and in that study it said you need a CIO. And so so we, in September 2000, did get one. And through the years, they still saw the IT department, and it was kind of called that, as that plumber, as that s- service provider. Um, and as late as 2016, that was the thought Um, Dr. Hayden is a rock star, um, a fantastic leader. She came in, and within the first month, she directed two things. There were issues with technology at the Library of Congress at the time. Um, And I won't get into that, but it was a lot. The, The first decision she made was to move the the OCIO, the Office of the chief information officer, out from under the chief operating officer, where all the services were, and put this OCIO directly under her, meaning the CIO would work for her. Not the number two, not the deputy librarian of Congress, but her. So I am fortunate enough not only to have a seat at the table, a a board member, and in the Library of Congress we call it the Executive Committee, but I also work directly for the Librarian of Congress, and that um, really makes a statement. She's very smart. Um, That makes a statement to the other businesses of the library. She was saying, this needs to be strategic. 
Um, they are not just a service provider. They need to be, and she doesn't use the term baked in, that's my phrase, but in essence, that's what she was saying. Um, and she um, wants the business leaders, that executive committee, that board, she wants them to collaborate, to um, work professionally together to reach our end goals. And that is what we all do. And I am absolutely on the board. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the strategic plan? We have numerous missions at the Library of Congress. I I mentioned our mission statement, Mm -hmm. but we're different from many libraries in that we have a, um, the, the United States Copyright Office is in the Library of Congress. So that's a different kind of mission. The Congressional Research Service is, um, they have analysts, 500 analysts, that um, write reports and memos and advise Congress on many, many, many different issues. And so that's a different type of mission. And then we have the typical, what you, what you see libraries, the catalogers and the librarians, the reference librarians, acquisition specialists for collections. And so that is baked in, oh, excuse me, that all of that, um, you will see in the strategic plan, but what do they need um, from a digital perspective? That's in the strategic plan. So it shows how digital and technology or whatever word you wanna use is um, uh, helping um, or playing a part in the business side. And so um, it was very thoughtfully put together. The strategic plan took about a year. Wow. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Um, In a description of your approach, it was said that the Library of Congress wanted to balance caution with digital experimentation. What did you avoid in this plan in regards to caution? So um, with with, um, digital experiments, first I'd like to say that machine learning, AI, Um, whatever term you want to use, um, it's a fast-moving train. Any time a technology is that fast, I think anyone, any organization should beware um, and tread lightly and do it um, methodically. Uh, We do have within OCIO, my my business uh, unit, um, we have a digital strategy directorate and within there we have what we call LC labs or LC innovation our innovation center and we do um, AI experiments machine learning experiments we are not new to the game we have been doing um, these type of experiments for about five years And I really thought about that. I was at a conference in October where there were a lot of CIOs there. And um, they wanted a panel um, to get, to put a panel together about where CIOs were with AI. And there were about 14 CIOs there. And um, they, I, I was near the end, which was very good. And what I got out of the first 12 or 13 was they were just dipping their toe in the water. They were just getting started and they were still figuring it out. Um, and that wasn't my story. My story was we've been at this and we've learned a lot and we are doing it in a very strategic, a very methodical way. Um, and so I thought about it. Why have we been, why are we ahead of the curve a bit on AI? And I, and I got it down to this, and, and it's called LAMS, Library, Archives, and Museums, that um, people in, in the LAM world have a tendency to be just a little bit ahead, maybe a, a lot of head, a, 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 a ahead than um, some of um, the other entities in the world, in, in my world, federal uh, agencies. Um, and I, I got it down to this, researchers. We, 
at the Library of Congress have a tremendous amount of historic collections that are, are unbelievably useful, not only to researchers, but to authors um, that write historical books. They, they, they come to our manuscripts reading rooms often. We know them, big name authors that want to use our collections. Um, and so um, what can those researchers do with our digital collections? And obviously, we do not have 100% of our collections digitized, and I'm asked that question a lot. My bad. Are you done, or when are you going to be done? And we're never, never going to be done um, because of the large amount of material, collect, collections material we have. But um, with the digital, the digitized material that we have, researchers want to do new and innovative things with the collections. So we have 22 reading rooms. Um, the researchers know manuscripts. They know what to expect out of manuscripts. They'll go to prints and photograph to go see, you know, the same subject over in prints and photographs. And it goes from there and all our, our geography and maps. Mm -hmm. Well, with digitized collections and AI, wouldn't it be cool if they could, you know, use AI to span across our fantastic, rich, historic data on a specific subject? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what AI is going to bring. But we are treading very lightly. So, um, first of all, the, the AI tools out there, the AI models, um, we've, in the five years, um, We've been doing experimentation, and we have not seen high percentage results. Um, and so, a lot about a lot of it is about learning, um, and the AI tools need to learn. But also, um, you know, why don't industry AI tools work well with our historic collections? Well, um, first of all, the AI tools and industry have a tendency to use um, the more recent English language, right? Mm -hmm. Well, our historic collections, let's say 1700s, 1800s, um, AI tools don't do so well in that. Right. And so we've had to, I don't want to say slow down, but very methodically um, determine how do we get around that? How do we train an AI tool with our historic type collections of, of the old language or even multiple language? We have over 400 collections in over 400 languages. So how do we get around that? So we do it very methodically. Uh, the other is um, we're pushed a lot um, by n different entities um, to use AI on uh, business processes, on workflows, to speed up some processes. And I will give you an example. Um, people may not realize that congress.gov is developed and maintained by the Library of Congress. In fact, um, the developers, developers software developers reside within OCIO, within my organization. Um, and so congress.gov is the, the authoritative legislative um, uh, information um, for the United States. Um, it has all the bills and, and it tracks as a bill um, goes through its process, if it reaches the floor, if uh, it becomes a law. The um, uh, Congressional Research Service has experts, and they have legislative analysts. Well, if you go to congress.gov, you will see a bill summary, so you don't have to read the 200-page bill. Mm -hmm. There's a bill summary. Um, we, the Library of Congress and CRS, are, uh, do not have 100% of bill summaries completed. We never have. Mm -hmm. So we can call that a backlog. 
So um, Congress would like us to reduce that backlog. We, uh, and, and they would like us to use AI to do that. That's a very dangerous proposition for us, to use AI, because our AI experiments have shown that um, the, uh, the percentage of success, we'll use that term, of accuracy, um, is low. We, um, on our previous experiments, we do have a bill summary experiment going on right now. Um, and so um, what we require out of the bill summaries is the um, authoritativeness, the um, nonpartisanship. Uh, it needs to be a nonpartisan bill s summary. It can't lean right, in any sure. direction. Right. Um, and it has to be um, uh, trustworthy. Um, another entity outside of the federal government took, because we have an API, took bills, mm -hmm. we, we allow this, from congress.gov and did an AI, ex uh, not an experiment, they just put it through their AI tool, an AI tool, mm -hmm. and um, they posted it. And they put a disclaimer on uh, what, what um, they posted, that these are bill summaries of the United States bills at this time mm -hmm. of the current Congress, and um, uh, it was done in AI, and it hasn't even been looked at by humans. Mm -hmm. The CRS analysts, uh, legislative analysts, took a couple of those and analyzed, because that's what they do, mm -hmm those AI bill summaries, and it was atrocious. Yeah. So um, it was not accurate. Um, we've been asked, would you be willing to put, um, bill, to speed up, reduce that backlog, just run it through the AI tool, and then put a disclaimer? If you come to the Library of Congress website, loc.gov or congress.gov or copyright.gov, the American public, researchers, um, other libraries, they expect it to be authoritative. Mm -hmm. So we cannot put a disclaimer on. That's a, a very specific example of something we will not do. Right. Put a disclaimer, run an AI tool, our data through an AI tool, and then just say this, because people don't read the disclaimers. Not everybody pays attention to the disclaimers, but more importantly, it's expected to be authoritative and nonpartisan. And so we will not do that. That's a, that's a very good example. Absolutely. That's like saying, well, our homework's halfway done. Here, right. It's okay, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of what you talked about, so I'm not sure yes. what you want to say on this. What were some of the biggest challenges arriving at your plan, and what were the greatest opportunities? I talked about the strategic planning process, and that involved everybody. So collaboration is, is vital, mm -hmm. um, having all parts of the business. Um, and then within... As we incorporate digital, um, we have many, many other processes, software approval process. Um, we have an agency data management initiative that um, what do we do with our data? Where is our data? What types of data? And so um, it's very important to us that we're process-driven mm -hmm. and we collaborate in, in our um, uh, processes um, for instance, the ADMI, we have a collaboration. It's agency-wide, institution-wide. We also have an AI working group mm -hmm. that's institution-wide. We have business partners there at the table. And so that, that, that's the process. Um, uh, the process is we're very process-driven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because we're a federal government, we have to be process-driven, but also it's a... Uh, it, it, it ensures we we are using taxpayer money appropriately. Um, and um, the biggest challenges, I mentioned before that that AI and, and technology in general is a fast-moving train. Yeah. And so we have to be very um, careful on what we um, uh, push out. Um, but that's that makes it harder 
that it's so fast and and our customers and our users want the new technology and so that's a challenge um my challenge is i see the big picture i see all these things we can do and i want to i want to quote dr seuss and say oh the things we could do right. And, and I, I, I'm just so excited on everything we can do, but we have to do it methodically and, and safely um, and deliberatively and strategic and collaboratively. A lot of buzzwords. That's so interesting because the technology is moving so fast. Yes. But you have to move so slow. It's I'm like, hoping it's not too slow. Well, no, I'm not, I'm, I don't <laughs> right. mean that in a yeah. critical way. Right, I'm just right, saying right. Yes. You, you, you see all the things you'd like to do, but yes. you have to move slow yes, because very you've got to be careful. So that's got to be a little bit of attention, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know. and the last biggest challenge is as technology and digital continues to move in a fast way, mm-hmm. we need to ensure that we do it safely. And what do I mean by safely? And that's the cybersecurity hitch. We need to ensure we don't open doors um, or that we continue to secure in, in a very um, methodical way that, um, and um, protect our data and protect our applications and our IT systems um, because we are a target, mm-hmm. because we, we um, our federal government, we have congress.gov, we have the copyright office, yeah. we know we're a target. And so we're constantly changing that IT stack, upgrading that um, IT stack. And with AI, we need to um, add tools um, and processes from a cybersecurity perspective to protect our users, to protect the, our our historic data, um, and that I feel that's a very big challenge, um, and that does I don't want to say. Uh, I will say that it keeps me awake at night, not because we're not secure, but because you know the bad guys are staying awake at night. It's an arms race. Yes, it's an arms race. That's exactly it. You know, who's moving faster? Yeah. And do not, we cannot stay stagnant on our, our cy- cybersecurity posture. Yeah. That's, that's uh, paramount, I'm yes. sure. Is there anything you'd like the higher ed technology community to know about where the Library of Congress is headed? There's a lot of exciting things. And I already talked about a library for all. Right. So I, don't, I won't repeat that. But we have three pillars in our plan, accessibility, discoverability, innovation. And, and Dr. Hayden's is that all uh, statement is all Americans connect to the Library of Congress. Um, we have APIs on loc.gov, and um, we continue to put more and more digitized content. So let me say it another way. We continue to digitize. Mm-hmm. So more collections, more historical collections. And that makes it more accessible as well. And then more accessible to people who don't have to fly in. Um, And then we have the APIs. So um, higher ed education can use that um, for their curriculum and for their libraries. They can say, well, the Library of Congress has that. We don't have that in our collections, but the Library of Congress has that. And that's exciting to me. And there's APIs. The, uh, and when we have that on congress.gov, so if it's higher education for lawyers, you know, for, uh, students, law students, that they can use that. Um, then um, we also are moving um, from our existing ILS to um, a what we're calling LCAP. Uh, um, but it's a folio open source solution, mm-hmm. and that will have APIs. In that project, we are moving from uh, in the library world called Mark Records, and um, that's um, the the Mark Records is a cataloging standard. We're moving to BitFrame, and when we move to Folio to LCAP but it's called Folio, there will be APIs on that. Mm -hmm. And I think higher education will be interested in that. They'll be interested that we're moving to BitFrame from Mark Standard, um, and they'll be interested that 
um, that there will be an API there. Currently, we do have bulk download opportunities for them, but not through an API. So I think that will help. Um, and then we, we, we just received our budget. Mm -hmm. And in there, uh, Congress would like us to do an, uh, an experiment on something called DNA storage. And um, that's taking some of our historic digital collections and putting it in DNA. Mm -hmm. The experiment will be first doing that and then see if we can open it and read it. And it, it goes... When you say DNA, can you break that down for me a little bit. I'm not quite grasping. But. Right. Um, and it's not human DNA. It's actually DNA. And, and this is From a the new tree of the paper. Yeah. Well, and, and of the, the actual collection information, the okay. digitized information will be there. And the thought mm -hmm. is 300 years from now, whereas uh, we have 175 petabytes of storage right now on a certain kind of storage. Well, if you can imagine how hard it is as fast as technology is moving, I have to then say, okay, now we've got to move from that storage to another storage right. because That's it changed. Huge. It's huge. Well, the thought is if we put our digital collections, our digitized collections in this new technology, uh, and Congress wants our, us to dip our toe into it, mm -hmm. and they funded it for an experiment to um, reduce it down to our di digitized collections, reduce it. That small. That small. And I keep going like this, <laughs> like a little vial. If, if you're listening, folks, she's it's holding a, her hand about, fingers about an inch apart. Right. And, and think of a little vial. Right. And so what our idea... Um, is, and, and we were talking to Congress uh, when it first came up and before it went into the bill, mm -hmm. um, and that um, the America 250 is coming, and that, oh, that's yeah. the anniversary right. of America. And we are on the America 250 um, program, meaning um, project, and so our idea is, and I don't know if we'll follow, if this will work, but our idea is, the reason I keep going with a little vial is I'm calling that, we are calling that a time capsule. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put 10 of our most historic digitized collections, like the draft Declaration of Independence, in there. Mm -hmm. And some other very oh. historic um, digitized content of the Library of Congress and we're going to put it in a time capsule of America 250. That's so cool. That's, that's very that's cool. Fun. That's yes. so much fun. That is great. This has been such a fascinating conversation, and I really appreciate your time, Judith, yes. and, and your expertise and, and insight into what goes into the Library of Congress technology. Yes. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. That was Judith Conklin, Chief Information Officer for the Library of Congress. I'm Jerry Bain for Educause. Thanks for listening.